Welcome to the Breakfast Leadership Show, where we interview global thought leaders on business, leadership, and life. Here's your host, keynote speaker, best-selling author, and chief burnout officer of the Breakfast Leadership Network, Michael Levitt. Welcome back. I've got Beate Schlatt on the line. Beate, how are you? I'm terrific, Michael. Can't wait. I'm looking forward to this conversation. You do some amazing work. So I want to share with the audience a little bit about you, and then we'll dive right into this conversation that's so timely with what's going on right now in the world. 100%. Yes. So I'm Beate Schlatt. I'm known as the growth architect, and I devise a strategic uh, blueprints and tools for visionaries and leaders who want to make a bigger impact and call it my, maybe my German background, or maybe that's just the way my brain brain works. Everything I do is like a system and a structure because it's just so natural to me. And I believe that a uh, process creates freedom. We're kindred spirits. I've got some German heritage on my dad's side and I am all about the systems because when you set it and it works, you don't have to use brain power to figure out how to do things. You're just like, okay, what do I need to be working on? And it guides you along the way. Otherwise, you're running around literally like a chicken with its head cut off. So 100%, yes. And, and not to mention the 50 different to-do lists then that you're working off at that time. So let's dive into burnout. I can't wait to talk about burnout. Yeah, burnout is one of those things that we have seen time and time again. And of course, it existed long before this pandemic. But what I've seen, and I'm I'm guessing you have too, with with the people and the teams you work with, uh, the the stress that everyone has been facing since this pandemic is coming from all different angles. And people are just, at this point, you know, well into the pandemic, even as we're exiting the pandemic in many areas, people are just frustrated and they, they basically want to throw their hands up. And we've even seen studies even in the workplace where in April, the number of people that quit their jobs was just astronomical. So everyone is just frustrated and upset and angered and stressed and burned out and all of that. So I'd love to hear what you're seeing out there. Yeah, I think that the number that we are worried about is that there might be up to 40% of, um, of turnover ahead of most businesses because people, as you said, they hung in there as long as they possibly could. They did the best they could. And a, a lot of times I think what happens in someone's mind is that something or someone has to be blamed for your dissatisfaction. I have an interesting theory, Michael, and this comes from a book I read a long time ago, and it's called The Optimistic Child. And the author said that especially in America, people seem to think they have a right to feel good all the time. And that's just not the case. So you have to do well to feel good. So if you put your attention to, well, I'm not feeling right, and then you get into that mindset, that spinning mode, why am I not feeling good? What is wrong? Why? What? What? do I need to change? Then you go in this spiral of dissatisfaction. And at the end of the day, either your relationship's going to go or your job's going to go because you, you, you have to take the pressure off somewhere. So my take on this is, Michael, that in a burnout world, the first journey really always needs to go inward. You know, it's like, why am I feeling this way? But not in whose fault is it? But what do I need to do to get myself out of this and in a better mindset? Because the universe is here to agree with you. So if you're in a miserable mood, the universe will agree with you and get you more of that. And if you're in a great mood, the universe will present you with more and better things. I love that angle, especially with the, you know, what you are asking for, you're getting. So if you're in the doldrums and you're upset about a situation or maybe a series of things, it's really just you know bringing that energy in for more of that to come instead of focusing on, okay, and I love how you, you approach it where you said, okay, I'm not going to blame anybody about this, but why do I feel the way that I'm feeling right now? What's going on? Many times it's from past experiences or an experience that you just had or an encounter triggered you in some negative way 
and it brought you back, even though you're not even necessarily thinking about that situation. You're thinking, oh, you know, and I, here I am, I did this. Or, you know, let's say you're a stock trader and you lost some money today. You're like, oh, losing money. You know, it brings you back to a time when you lost a lot of money because of a job loss or something like that. Although that's not what happened at this particular moment, you're bringing back some memories and experiences and you're applying, th- applying them to a current situation when many times that's not the right thing to do. And instead, of, it's just just stop and go, okay, why do I feel this way? All right. It's a moment in time. I can change the direction of how I'm feeling today. Let's do that. And once you of being able to do that, it, it reduces the stress and it doesn't create the prolonged stress, which of course turns into burnout. Yeah, I think you made a very important point, Michael, because I believe that people oftentimes get really caught up in their old programming. So I'm working with, um, you know, a very successful entrepreneur who over the last couple of years had a couple of hard bumps, right? So he's invested in real estate and into a project. He put his time, energy, passion and money into it. And the pandemic came and the project is a, a food hall, right? Where people come together in community. I mean, the worst thing you can possibly think about when we were thinking about the pandemic. And what happens is that suddenly the voice of the parents that are caught in their middle class thinking, and it works great for them, right? And now they're retired and they have their pensions and they go, well, why don't you get a job? But the man hasn't had a job in 40 years. And now it's like, well, you got to get a job. And so I said to him, do you actually think you're employable or is this just an old programming that pops up? And then, then our brain volunteers 50 to 100 negative thoughts of everything we've ever experienced that's relatable to this negative experience, making it a hundred times as bad. Remember that one time when when your girlfriend ran away because you didn't have a job. Remember when you lost your car because you couldn't afford to pay the you know the lease. Remember when you know you you had to move into a smaller office and suddenly all these things are completely irrelevant to what's happening at this very moment, pop up and then your brain just explodes with negativity and now you're back in that in that crazy spiral. Happens to all of us and unfortunately for some of us, it happens more often than it should. So how do we, how do we get out of that mindset? And mindset is so critical on how we approach life. It, it's the driving force in the direction of where we go, whether it's dealing with setbacks or even success Uh, because sometimes you get success and you think, okay, or your definition of success, of course, let me frame it that way. And all of a sudden you think, okay, now the sky's the limit. I'm all, I'm just going to go straight up in the air and everything's going to be great. And that's not reality. There's ebbs and flows of things. So, you know, how can people work on their mindset? What are some systems that you've seen really work well for entrepreneurs, especially because we have a big audience of of those on our show? But you know, what are some things that have worked out for them as far as you know setting the right mindset for them to be able to succeed in in th- throughout their life? Excellent point to share. I, for me, mindset is a really a daily practice, and I find that. You know, and I built and sold a business to Bill Gates. And then afterward, I was kind of like, ah, who needs to do any more of that? You know, I've, I've succeeded. And then you fall back into your old programming because you're not constantly counteracting it. I think about it like if you were to take a USB port and you plug it into the bottom of your skull, that's your original programming. And that program runs all the time. That's the original operating system. And in order for you to override that, you need to take a different USB port with different information, plug it in on the other side and then constantly override the old programming. The minute you don't do that, the old programming finds a loophole and goes right back in. It's amazing on how powerful our subconscious is. So the first thing is you need to understand that that's what our brains are designed to do, what our subconscious is designed to do to keep us exactly where we are because where we are is what we know and that is considered safe, even if it's absolute misery. The second part is that the mindset work is really a daily practice on, you know, and it's, you know, and I I think meditation is great and and enchanting is great and yoga is great and all that stuff is great. But mindset is the, the, 
way you think and the way you control your thought process in your brain. I listen to a podcast or to some sort of mindset training every single day. When I walk, when I drive, when I drive to the grocery store, some of these, you know, great podcasts. I mean, you have a great podcast. Some of these podcasts, a half hour, 15 minutes, sometimes 10 minutes. That's enough to just give you the constant reiteration to say, man, I got to stay in this mindset of possibility. And then number two, you got to limit your exposure to negative Nellies. And, uh, and when somebody wants to take you down in their misery, you have to be very clear that on whether you listen to the news, whether you listen to that person, whether you listen to the constant negative programming of artificial intelligence who only measures engagement, not the truth and not positivity and, uh, and, and have a, I call this clean thinking, you know, practice the clean thinking habit. And finally, Uh, You have to take full responsibility for everything that's happening in your life to say, I'm, I am where I am because I thought myself to this point. So if I got myself here, I probably can, can think myself out of it again and then really shift that mindset. And when, you know, and I've gotten so much better at it because about a year and a half ago, I was so angry as a speaker, as a trainer, you know, traveling around and then everything stopped and I fell into the same thing. Why is this happening to me? Boo-hoo crew, right? And then finally, Michael, I said, I can't, this is not who I am. If it was that great, it wouldn't have fallen apart. So what do I need to do now to create secondary income streams, passive revenue, uh, where do I need to record courses or trainings, what other companies do I need to collaborate with, so this isn't going to happen to me again. And once you focus on that, the way out of the paper bag and you take responsibility, suddenly stuff starts, starts to happen out of seemingly nowhere. It's that take responsibility thing that a lot of people think they don't have the either the ability or necessarily maybe the awareness that they can actually do that. And uh, for me, I, you know, I think often in, in the beginning of the pandemic, same situation. Mine wasn't necessarily as negative, but it was definitely a defeating type of feeling. Um, and of course, my, my father had just passed away uh, literally the week before everything locked down. And so I was dealing with that and dealing with the pandemic and the loss of everything. And thankfully for me, you know, from an income standpoint, I was able to, to pivot uh, because I realized, okay, what do I need to do? I, I, I caught it quickly. And, you know, first I'm like, okay, why am I in this funk? And I'm like, okay, first I thought, okay, do I have COVID? Am I, is this a symptom? <laughs> you know, and, and it, you know, like I'm literally, you know, I'm not a hypochondriac, but I'm like, okay, what is this? So you look and like, no, you're just kind of feeling you're you're feeding off the emotions and the negative Nellies of you know the media and everything like that. And I tell people all the time, it's like you gotta limit your exposure to the news because it's all negative. Doesn't matter what flavor you like, whether it's Fox, MSNBC, CNN, whatever, you gotta limit your exposure to it because it is all negative and that weighs on you and stresses you out and prolonged stress turns into burnout. So you know you don't live in a cave, but you know, control what you consume. But also, you know, a phrase that uh a therapist that I know really well told me once and she was you know, talking with me because I was working with her and she said, I, I think Michael, you are allergic to drama. Um, <laughs> you, you, you don't deal with it very well. And it was such an enlightening statement. I'm like, you know, you're right. And, and I, and I started, you know, thinking back, of course, in, in a non judgmental way. It's like, okay, let's, let's open up the book of Mike and see, okay, what's happened so far? And like, oh, yeah, dr- dramatic situation. Oh, yeah, I didn't like that. And then you start going through it and you're like, okay. So that, that's a, a boundary for me. It's like, okay, let's try to minimize drama as much as I can. You know, I love watching dramas, I love movies that are dramatic, but as far as real life, drama and all that. I'm like, mm, no, I just, I can't deal with that. And that's an awareness thing. And I'm taking responsibility and saying, no, I'm going to limit my exposure to the best of my ability by doing that. And it makes my life 
a lot easier and a lot better for me um, when I do that. And again, it's it's, it's that awareness and, and really taking you know a look at how you were doing things, like you did, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic where you were angry, justified. You know, it, I, I get it. You know, from a speaking standpoint, when you're used to going around and being on stages and interacting with people, it's a revenue stream. It's an opportunity for you to meet people and all that. And all of a sudden, that rug got pulled. The orchestra started playing, and days over. And you're like, "What in the world?" Now, thankfully, it's starting to reopen again. So, uh, all of the you know speakers in the world are going to actually be able to go do speaking engagements again it's going to feel really weird at the beginning i think for some of us like, i think so too it's like, yeah <laughs> it's, it's like stage microphone okay to, how do i turn this on where, where's wow there's a lot of people here this is strange <laughs> yeah. but we're, we're, we're you know part part of me when i when i speak i mean it'll, it'll i don't think it'll fit on my bag but part of me wants to like hold up this big gigantic cardboard like zoom window with the more stop video security participants just got to hold that up while i give a talk because i think people are so used to seeing that but um, i'm looking forward to getting back out there and i'm sure you are too so let's talk about uh, the systems you're talking about, the five, the five step thing you were mentioning at the beginning of the show. I'd really love to hear, you know, a little bit more about that. How did the, how did you discover that? Because it's obviously something you you've built, but you know, what are some things that you know came to light as you were building that? Well, so number one, you know, as I said, I I was uh, building a lot of businesses, and and you know, I was making two steps forward, three steps back, you know, three steps forward, one step back. And it just kept going up and down and up and down. And finally I said, you know, I can't continue like this. And I, you know, was $135,000 in debt and, um, you know, things were not good. I jokingly say I'm an eight time disaster survivor. Little did I know I was going to add a pandemic to fires, floods, earthquake, riots, 9-11 and a tsunami. And, um, I recognized that there is a cadence to business, that there that things really come in sequential order. And I built the business because I looked at people that start their social media. And then I ask them, where are you driving the traffic? And they say, I don't know. I said, well, what are you putting money in ads for then? Or they go and they say, well, I don't know if this offer works. And then you say, well, who is your client? And they go, well, everybody really can use my 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 service, and then you go, mm, that's not the truth. And so I looked at what people sort of commonly do or where the misunderstandings are, and then because of my love for systems, I designed the Five Star Success Blueprint because I wanted to give entrepreneurs, business owners, and even companies the roadmap, the blueprint to say, here is what needs to be in order before you can align anything in your business and optimize it. So number one is the first star is the idea. What is it that you're doing? Why are you doing it? And who are you doing it for? That's at the bottom of everything. If you don't have that, you don't have a business, you have a maybe a, a romantic love story with an idea, right? But that's not, that's not what we call a, an idea. The second one is the offer on whether it's a product or a service, however you package it, if you bundle it, if you uh, do value packages, bonuses, whatever that is, but the offer has to be obviously in direct relationship to the idea. The third star is the system. And the system is automation, process, uh, project management. It's uh, the way you do things. It's your standard operational procedure is how, how the life cycle workflow goes, how you process map your organization, who does, who does what, what's the organizational chart, you know, as you grow, where does that go and who goes in which position as you, you know, as the pyramid goes further up and broadens at the bottom. The fourth part is your team. Who, you know, who is the right person for the job? Please, no mini-me cloning. You're not in business to find other people like Michael. So it's a business full of Michaels doing all the same things that Michael does. Somebody in sales, it's somebody in marketing, and somebody who does your social media, is somebody in business development. You know, so you really have to set it out with subject matter experts that are good at one particular thing and not good at everything. So you feel better about because you built it knowing a whole bunch of stuff. And then finally, it comes to you as a leader because then typically what I see, Michael, 
and I bet you see the same thing in your work, is when the leader, when the business owner needs to shift into business leadership where they're managing more, they're less in the business. And that's a huge transition for most business owners where they go, well, I know how to do that better. Yeah, but should you do your own bookkeeping? Well, I know how to do that better. Should you do outbound sales calls or should you have only the closing calls, you know, where where we really have to wrangle sometimes things away from the business owner and make sure that the business operates. So that's in essence, the five-star success, success blueprint. I love that system and it's well designed. And of course, I'm not just saying that because I've got German heritage, I'd say, but I agree with it. it especially, I want to talk about the last part for a moment. And you see this all the time and I see it all the time is entrepreneurs, especially new ones or even ones that have been in business for a long time. They, they tend to want to fall into that. Well, I can do that. And I just go and do that and it'll save you some time. And that means they're, they're taking away opportunities from people that are actually better at that particular role than that entrepreneur. We, we tend to think, hey, we're the greatest thing ever and we can do everything. Well, then you're not going to do anything. It's like the, the comment you made a couple of moments ago about, well, who's your product or service for? Well, everybody can use it. Well, that means no one can use it. You need to narrow that down. You got to find out the ideal person, you know, client, whatever, that needs what you have and they exist and they've got, you know, certain characteristics about them. You need to find out who that is. Doesn't mean you can't sell or service to other people, but that's where your focus should be because that's where you're going to have your revenue streams that align things up because they're going to be in alignment with what you're offering and what they need. And as a leader, I know, you know, early on in my career, I was horrible at delegation. And now, you know, my last um, assistant that I had when I was still you know, working for an organization before I launched this business, uh, you know, she used to yell at me all the time because the pendulum swung so far in the delegation that I didn't want to do anything. I'm like, okay, what's this? Okay, who could do this? And I would literally, I, I would just basically be a, a system navigator for a last, lack of a better term. It's like, here, do this, here, do this. And then they said, well, what do you do? Oh, well, I, I hand out work. <laughs> and, and it's like, no, but, but again, there's a reason for that because once you get to the point where you're working on what only you can do, that's when you know, okay, that's where things are going. And again, you, you got to review it just like, you know, everything else we do when we check in with ourselves on a daily basis. What am I doing? Literally. I mean, in a lot of, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't even pay attention to that. They're, they're just so busy in what they're doing. They don't even know what they're actually doing. It's like, take a step back, mm -hmm. document everything that you're doing right now look at it and go, should I be doing this or should somebody else do it? Or should I stop doing it? Is it not benefiting my business? Well, then stop it, you know, then and move forward with it. Because if we constantly do that, we get more fine tuned on what we're doing. And then the impact that we have is really, really impactful uh, when we when we can narrow down and get things right. That's a really important point, Michael, I think we need to make for your listeners is that this is about on whether or not you have the tools to make the impact you came here to do. Because if you're running a business because you want to be, you know, the god of your business and everybody to kiss the ground you walk on, that's 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 a different type of a business. But when you build a business, it becomes its own entity and it has its own pulse and it's its own, it's its own thing. It needs its own food. It needs its own nourishment. It needs its own love. It needs to go and sleep sometimes and get a rest or a makeover, or you have to, you know, declutter it or make sure that the people are using it right. But the detachment from the business as your baby to its own child that you that get to nourish until it grows up and maybe you sell it or maybe you keep it is really the shift that I find very challenging for a lot of business owners. They say, yeah, I want to sell it. And then I say, well, what do you do to set up your operations so that it's a transparent way to run a business? Well, I don't want to pay taxes. Well, I said, you can't get a good fee for your business if you don't pay taxes because that's what what the buyer will look for is your spreadsheet and uh, and how much 
profit it shows and how much taxes you pay. Well, they will know that I will... Uh, that I run my books a certain way. I'm like, well, you can't have it both ways. You're either going to go and set it up for a particular purpose or you set it up for a different purpose, but you can't cross mix that and have the fingers crossed it'll all work out kind of idea. There has to be a plan on the way you built it with a purpose that you built it for. And then you execute on that. Of course, you adjust your business the way you want to adjust it on the way there. No, I love that. And that's a really good point to to wrap up on is for launching your business, you know, what's what's the end game? You know, do you want to sell the business? Do you want to hand it off to your your children or to family or friends or things like that? Have that as part of your planning. Uh, and of course you can always adjust it as time goes on. But yeah, otherwise you think you have this business that's worth a lot, but you really don't have anything that is they could be purchased because you're like not making revenue. You're not doing this. You know that's what they're going to be looking at. It's like, is it profitable? Is there systems in place that when we take it over, we don't need you to run the business per se because we bought it. It's our business. We want to be able to continue it and not have to figure out we're starting from ground zero because if you're starting from scratch. Well, they're just going to do that themselves anyway. And they're not going to bother with that. So get those systems in place, you know, work with, you know, individuals like yourself to, if you don't have systems, get them in place. Uh, it'll, it'll make your business a lot better and uh, it'll improve your life and your life as an entrepreneur for sure. Yes. And, you know, again, it goes back to where we started. This is all part of your mindset is what do you really want and what are you willing to take responsibility for and how much courage are you willing to have to go and pursue that dream? And that's really the message that I have for your audience is that if, you know, a single mom immigrant from Germany, $135,000 can make it and become a multimillionaire, then um, I would say it's possible. And now use that as your excuse eradicator, because now you've heard it from someone who did that and go out and go do it. That's awesome. So, Beate, I've loved this conversation. Where can people find out more about you and this incredible work you're doing? Yes, so you find more information about the Five Star Success Blueprint on my website at beatechalette.com. And I also, because I love systems so much, I brought a gift for your audience, Michael. So I brought the Airtight Avatar. We talked about how important it is to have your very best client figured out. So you go to airtightavatar.com. It's a masterclass on how to find really good clients and all the different elements that go into it. It even has a checklist where you can go through and uh, and just go and mark everything off. And at the end of it, you will have your customer profile, your ideal customer profile on whether you are in business right now, want to be in business or want to upgrade or want to review this Airtight Avatar Masterclass is really right for anyone who wants to get focused on who their ideal client is. Well, thank you very much for that. It's very generous of you. And I'll definitely have that information in the show notes. So you have to Great to finally connect with you. I'm looking forward to uh, our continued conversations down the road and um, continued success in everything you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for listening to The The Breakfast Breakfast Leadership Leadership Show, Show. part of The Breakfast Leadership Network. Visit breakfastleadership.com for tips on empowering your business and your life.